What are the things that have stuck out most in my memory? It goes right back to my very young days, the age of seven years. In 1910, I can remember my father waking me up and taking me out onto the veranda in our home at 89 Shakespeare Street to view Halley's Comet. Now, that has made a big impression in my memory, and I can see it as though it was only yesterday. And uh, it is then they expect it to be to, ret to return again in 1986. Well, that would make me 83 years of age, and I hope I live long enough to see it. <laughs> it was a, about the year 1865 when the boat Christian Sands left Australian ports for the old country. Due to storms in the Tasman, they were blown over to the west coast. They arrived at the mouth of the Terramacau, that's the river between Grey and Okatika. They came into the Terramacau, one of the few boats that ever got in there, and went into the lagoon on the south side. They went right down to the bottom end of the lagoon, which would be a mile or so down. Overnight and over the next couple of days, terrific storms from west coast weather at its worst came up and down came debris and mullock and so forth from the Serpentine Creek, which blocked that lagoon. Therefore, the Christian Sands was landlocked. The people then had nowhere to go. They couldn't get it out. They only had shovels. They couldn't dig their way out for the boat. So the Christian Sands stayed there, and it is there to this day. Some of the new people, when they come to the coast, they take the film out onto the beaches with the driftwood or into some hotel where there's gallons of beer and they do not put the coast in its true perspective. The coasters do not, only very, very seldom, perform like that. But we are forever shown as being either in a hotel where there's gallons of beer and singing around an old piano with voices that would crack a kerosene tin, or out on a beach where there's a few hippies with driftwood. That's not the coast at all. Yes. Yes, you come to work. Righty oh. Bye. Car in Cobden. Front car. 24 Peel. And whereabouts would you like to go? Oh, Just the end of the post office. I don't know. It's not pension day, is it? Is that right? No, no, we don't bother with the pension. You don't bother with the pension? Don't get the idea that we're rich because we're No, no, well, this is it. People in good positions working, and they, they have two incomes. Oh, yeah, well, that would make a big difference, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, I think. I mean, if you had two incomes coming in, you'd be quite happy. Yes, right. Oh, I mean, you'd be unsatisfied with one. You'd be able to get a tax every day of the week. <laughs> Hello, love. Oh, you want your money? Oh, this is Marilyn who can tell you lots of funny things. Come on, Marilyn. No, I've got to go. I've got the dog and the cat. Oh, you're sorry. <laughs> Goodbye, Gloria. Bye. They're frightened. Hello, Marilyn. <laughs> Look at the two of them. Frightened of you. Um, I was going to say, if I've got a reading library book, you know, if I put it down at night, so I think of the, some, the page, you know, I'll think, oh, that's Mrs. So-and-so, 136, so-and-so, page 136, and I always remember them by addresses. And the same with people coming towards me in town, our customers. 
I'll think, oh, this was 100 High Street, or, you know, I never think of them by their name. Well, uh, when I was uh, a young person growing up on the coast, my dad had a, a hotel, a tavern subsequently, it was called in Greymouth here, and uh, I remember that uh, the, the pace of life there was um, as it is on the West Coast, no great rush, and people could sort of do things at their leisure, and uh, people were counted by what they were, not by what they had, not by their possessions or uh, or their, their status in the community. If they were good people, that was fine. If they weren't, it was equally fine, but there was a black and white division there. But it had its funny sides too, because this pace of life, I think, could be demonstrated by Bob Coombe, who was a milkman in the community at that time. He had a horse called Dolly, and she used to draw the, the cart around, and uh, Bob used to deliver the milk to the hotels. Well, this particular hotel that my dad had was called the Brian Brew, and I was up on the balcony one day, and. Uh, looking down and Bob Coombe and Dolly arrived, they clip clopped along and Dolly stopped right there and uh, Bob got off and take the milk and but he always stayed and had a few drinks as well, you know, <laughs> the delivery wasn't that rushed and uh, for a bit of a devilment I suppose I, I said uh, get up to Dolly and Dolly leisurely took, leisurely took off and strolled up the street, stopped right outside the next pub. Of course when Bob came out he was a, a man who had a, a crippled leg and uh, you could hear Bob about five blocks away but for Dolly it was a conditioned reflex and that's the way life went. During the mining time we had uh, quite a big population of Chinese on the coast. They used to run their opium dens, packapoos, and we had a Chinatown in the, in the freehold part of Greymouth. Well the practice was uh, on a burial you'd see the uh, instead of an ordinary uh, uh, hearse, we just see a drag taking the body up there and they used to throw out chocolates and sweets to the kiddies and we used to always be there to pick them up. And the practice was, before they lowered the body, was for them to put, the friends used to put coins on the coffin. What for, I don't know. But however, there was a particularly popular Chinese one on one occasion being buried and instead of coins, there were pound, and, pound notes and five pound notes and a lot of money, something approaching a hundred. One bright fellow uh, uh, amongst the crowd, he thought, no, he can't see this going down, and uh, he went to the um, he went to the chief mourner and said, look, he said, I had the highest regard to this poor old chappie. He said, I'd, I'd love to give a decent donation uh, on the coffin, but he said, I'm short of, uh, I've got no ready cash on me. Now, he said, there looks to be the thick end of a hundred dollars, hundred pounds on the coffin now, what is the day that I take the money and give you my cheque for a hundred and that gone down? Which happened, because his cheque went down and he pocketed the money and he shot off. And you weren't troubled with the floods this time? Hey, well, the floods moving on them were down, but uh, it didn't even come in the yards. Oh, that was good though, wasn't it? Oh, and the time before, it, you know, five days before that, it came up to the back step. Oh, Not got... on it, just touching it. Oh, oh, you'd have your fingers crossed that night. <laughs> well, the kids stay till 10 o'clock this week. Just in case? Yeah. Oh, well. And I took a sleeping pill. If the tide come in, it could come in. You reckon? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't know. If you had to wake up in the morning and put your feet in water, you'd have known. <laughs> yes, God, wouldn't you? <laughs> there was a, a lady who lived up in Mount Street, a Mrs. Henniker. And uh, she was having a tremendous amount of trouble with her sewage. And she always called on this uh, legacy gentleman uh, to come and do the repairs. So she wasn't having much success with it. So she rang him up and she says, Mr. Seddon, I'm sorry, I've got to step now. Uh, the, um, I'm still having trouble with my plumbing. Well, he said, Mrs. Henniker, I'm sorry, I can't do any more about it. He said, the whole trouble is that this sewage system is only a four inch pipe. And somebody up here has a six inch orifice. <laughs> hey, little Rush. Yeah, you bring a bloody crowd around there wondering what the hell's wrong. I've got Sydney Samways, I'm taking him home. He's got the hoodicky. Yes. 
My word, yes. <laughs> Who was that? Oh, that was Master Kennedy. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, stirring you along, you see. Got into that couple. Said it was time you were home. <laughs> it is new. What have you been doing downtown this morning, sir? Oh, I don't know. The came up and had a look at my telly. Oh, yeah. Picked it up, took it away. Had it for an hour and three, an hour and 20 minutes. And I got a on $40, 41 cents. Yeah? Yeah. I said, I'll give you the 41 cents, right? He said, oh! He screamed like a m***. <laughs> oh, they're good people, though. Ah, oh, you stirred him up, did you? Close, <laughs> he glared at me. He glared at me. Harrison, he's up here, now. Is he? Dr. Harrison. Oh, yeah. Huh? I hope you haven't yeah. been telling them hey, stories. Chris, I'll tell you what, we'll have him educated before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know the fastest thing in the world on a push bike, Sid? Yeah. Or the fastest thing in the world on two wheels? What? The Pope riding a push bike through Belfast. Oh, yeah. Bird Jefferson said to me one time, he says, he says, we're all the same age. And, well, within a, within a few months. And uh, we all play football, tennis, cricket, everything together. And um, Merv said to me, what about us having a bet once? We'll all put in $100. And the one that lives the longest takes the lot. I said, right, I said, I'll give you a post and check. To further illustrate the attitude towards death, one of our sisters, in fact, she's the oldest sister in our convent here, Sister Berkman's. She was born in Greymouth and has spent all her life here, and she's 96 this year. She told me of a former pastor of the parish who said he always wanted, when he died, to be buried in the Greymouth Cemetery because it's near the beach and you're actually buried in sand. And the reason why he wanted to be buried there was that on the day of the resurrection, he'd just get up out of the grave, shake himself, he'd be clean as a whistle. <laughs> He was a well-known drinker, you know what I mean? And when we used to go pick him up, we had a lot of bother getting him out of places, like hotels and, you know, cafes. And anyway, he went to... He used to go into a cafe in... Well, it's not there now, but in Albert Street, in town. And uh, the thing was, we used to say to the public and the, you know, cafeteria people, well, get him out. Oh, no, he'd never come out. So this night he went into the cafe to get him out, and he was sitting there, and his face was down, and he was, Fishing tips and taxi driver thought, oh, he's got to sleep again, you know. So he gets up and he goes, come on, he said, you haven't got all night to waste, you know. Either you're going or you're not. And he just went crunk on the floor and he was dead. <laughs> not a gag anywhere. Oh, yeah, a big percentage of our business um, works from hotels, especially with this, um, when the drink driving blitz is on, that's the, that's the thing that builds their business up a wee bit because a big percentage of them realise that it's not, not worth getting caught, so they get a taxi rather than get caught. They look upon it as everybody on the West Coast being an alcoholic or be a sop. They're not. They've all, always drunk fairly leisurely over long periods. We didn't flout the law. It was just a local law. And providing we kept within those local laws, we were left alone. Occasionally somebody overstepped the mark and the police knocked them off. But generally, we drank over a long period. And these were hard-working men, men who worked in the mines. When they come out of the mine, they're very dry. They work at something like 70 degrees all day under, underground, and they're very dry when they come up. And they can stand five or six long beers. And there's not many beer drinkers who are alcoholics. It's the spirit drinkers, the winos, the sherry drinkers, they are the ones. Oh, look, he's had his share. Has he? Yeah. Oh, my God. Two jugs and two twelves. Is that all? That's yeah, all. Is that all she give you? And this is going on the wireless, I suppose. Oh. What's happened? What, is he in the bad books? Yes. Oh. 
everything went all to Hong Kong yesterday. Did I? Ah, he hadn't, uh, been, he hadn't been singing again, has he? No, I was not with him yesterday. Ah. Going to Nolly Base. Ah, yes. And what's the, uh, what's the visit to town for today? Oh, the doctor. Yes. That was no doctor that he come out of. Eh? <laughs> hey? What's the cap for? That wasn't no doctor that you come out of, mate. What's the cap for? The cap. Let's keep me bald head warm. <laughs> oh, there we go again. That's to keep the bald head warm, yeah. Mind you, at 10 o'clock in the morning, it keeps the sun out of my eyes, too. Is there a bloody wireless going in the thing? Is there a wireless going? No, I've got it turned off. I've got to go now. What are you going to sing? He's not going to sing, is he? Oh, good. Oh, no. If I'd only had two bucks. What was that one? <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to hear that one, Dad. Oh, I reckon that's a good one. Yeah, I tried that to go on I was trying to think of it the other day, and I couldn't think of it. The bird of paradise. The bird, yeah, that's right, the bird of paradise. Ah. Oh. Don't let the bird of paradise. <laughs> and he sang that for a couple of days. I never hear anything else. When are we going to clear all that up? Uh, it'll be a while before they do that, I think. Is, uh, are you going straight home, Gil, or are you yeah. going... No, we're going to the pub. You're going to the pub? We are yeah. not. Go to the pub. Go to the pub, yeah, it's good to go to the pub. We're not. Look, I'm 25. How long will it take us to get out there? Oh, well, I can get out there quick if you want to. Right, shake her up. Shake her up, right. Naughty. Mum said you're not allowed to go to the pub. Did you say that? I said that I still say it. Not even for one. No. Oh. You're doing over 30 miles now, too. Oh, thanks very oh, much. shut up. <laughs> You're the head You just about hit that car. Any just more? ignore him, yeah. I just ignore him, just ignore him. I'll put him in the boot. Bucks, do no. Oh. I think she said no, Gil. Oh, I think so, dude. You have a little one, though. Oh, I don't think I better. I'm working. What, what's that uh, wire up the back of your head for? Oh, that's. Oh, I've got a short circuit on my head and my brain. Yeah, you got that wrench. You don't have to be mad to drive a cab, but it no, helps. Oh, I know, uh, but it helps. Yeah, it helps a lot. Yeah. What a beautiful little township this is. It's lovely. Well, the bus is still here. Yep. Oh, I think we'll miss that, won't we? Now, only, give him on in, dear, and have a vodka. only give no. him. Only give him. Only give him. Bloody vodka. I'll bring one out. Only give yeah, him six. Minutes. I'll throw it out. Now, let's just finish with you, fella. One beer. One beer. One beer. He's a bad boy, isn't he? Yeah, Pierre Baker, when he gets this far. I'm bad if I can do anything with him. Oh, I think you would have won if we had gone straight home. I don't think he would have argued too much. There used to be regular dances in a place they called the United Pavilion, run by United Football Club, and it was a very, very popular Wednesday night dance. You started at 8 o'clock and you had every dance and right through until midnight, 1 or 2 in the morning, and the fancy dress balls were just out of this world. You can see the change coming because in those particular days, if anybody arrived in the hall who'd had a drink. No girl would dance with him.
country bumpkin that come to town and he gets off the uh, train at the uh, Wellington station there and he hops out onto the street and looks up and down and he, he didn't know where he was or where he was going and he, he um, spotted the taxi rank there so he sees this nice flash Mercedes there so he goes up the driver and he said oh could you show me around Wellington and the driver thought good god what have I got here so he gets him in the way they go and he asked him where he was from and he was obviously worked out that he was from way back in the bush somewhere and so the young fellow asked the cab driver he said what is the thing on the front there for which was the emblem on the front of the bonnet and the two wing mirrors on the side the cab driver thought i'll have this joker on so he said oh they're me sights he said i use them for knocking pedestrians down oh gee he said i've never seen one of them so they're hopping up the road and the cab driver thought i better put on a bit of an act for him so sees a pedestrian just going to step off the crossing so he swoops in fairly close to him you see and the way past he goes looks up in the rear vision mirror and here's this pedestrian flat out lying on his back he looks at this joke as the passenger he had there and he says good god the passenger just said you'll have to get your sights fixed he said if i hadn't opened the door you'd have missed that one Oh dear. Just looking in the obituary, so you'll be in here tomorrow. Thanks very much. Mm. Now, give us an excuse. And it better be good. Some, right? some kind person turned the power off last night. That is... Wasn't my fault. Right. That is a feeble excuse. The best I can think of, because it's the truth. And I had to get picked up by a, a, well, not a, a civilian this morning. Oh. Well, I was looking because Phil's gone some front car. You cheeky. <laughs> You're not front car at all. Now, look, if I hadn't rung you up, what would you have done? I'd have been still in bed. Well, it's a bad example, eh? Right? Yeah, I know. I know. It's terrible. Eh? Only trouble is that the wife with me. I was mad with you. Well, you think I was? My head was going round when I jumped out of bed that quick. I couldn't believe it. I'm taking... I'm trying to count to ten before I even answer. I counted to ten before I said good afternoon to you. Mm, a nice bite but you can imagine what it was like. I'm laying there half asleep, and next thing I just turn the alarm off, and next thing the phone goes, and, and this voice snaps over the phone, and you come to bloody or pick me up. And I looked, I was trying to get me wits about me because I looked at the clock and I thought, she's mad. It's 20, I was past, mad all right. she's, it's 20, <laughs> 20 past six, and she's ringing me up. So I have been waiting on the corner since 10 past seven. On the you, corner. But you know that I'm never late for you. Not that late. I've never been that late in four years. John, it is five to eight. You are that late. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. mm. Almost an hour. Mm. Lovely. You're lovely, all right. I enjoyed the sleep. Bad example. Bad example. I didn't like getting woken up. Well, how, uh, I'm going to put in the, in the booking pad for, to ring you at six in the morning. Thanks very much. Uh -huh. My alarm was set for 20 past six. You were one minute late. It was 21 minutes past six when you rang. It was at hell. So mm. that means it was 21 minutes past seven. That's just not good enough, John. I do not good enough. You can have me resignation. We've already done it for you. Oh, good. Uh, that means I can go home again? No. You're relegated to the parcel brigade today. Yeah, I thought I might be. Phil was insulting about you. Was he? You're horrible, wasn't That's he? unusual for Phil. there, Fred. You going to town again? Yeah. There's a big square across the road there one night. Good. Big square around the road, John. Yeah. They're gold miners, these people. Gold miners, yeah. They're right. <laughs> 
Well, perhaps I should start by saying it's still a very much a pioneering masculine dominated society which has certain roles clearly defined for its women folk and I've seen that on numerous occasions whether it ranges from only the women come to the PDA meeting because that's her job I have been in a situation where I got up after a meal and started to do the dishes yeah. and virtually caused a divorce because there was a man doing woman's work and the bloke did not want his wife to see that. Her job was to do the dishes. As it was her job to run the bath while he was getting up, while he was bathing, she was preparing breakfast. While he was eating breakfast, she was putting his clothes out. While he's putting his clothes on, she was cleaning his shoes. A Which clearly you... defined role model. Yes, yeah, that was extreme. Then... Yes. Yeah, that was, that's been recorded. It was a case of a pregnant girl in Hokitika sued a, a later paternity claim against the alleged father of the child. Uh, she gave her evidence. The defendant gave his evidence, but in support of that evidence, he brought three of his cobbers along to tell them uh, who, who said that they'd also had intercourse with the girl. Uh, the magistrate on the bench, much to the horror of the clerk of the court, he made a, an order calling upon all the, the defendant and the three witnesses to pay half a crown each per week for, towards the maintenance of the child until the child would, uh, attained the age of 16 years. <laughs> oh, another one with him. This guy was quite a character, and this may be a bit rude, this one, but uh, he'd sometimes be behind his, the bar, and if a few strangers were about, his wife would be there, and he'd call out across the bar, he'd say, Bobby, Bobby, how about a jump? Yes wife and he'd come out from the behind the barn that hold hands and jump up and down in the middle of the room <laughs> I won't mention name but a certain well-known gentleman in a, a certain town fairly close to Graymouth uh, he was uh, a certain lady came to me one day and she looks she says, I'm pregnant and you're the farmer he said I propose to take paternity proceedings against you. Well, you don't, do, don't do that he said don't do that at all he said what I'll do I'll enter into an agreement I'll agree to pay you Ten shillings a week until the child reaches 16 years of age. Well, in due course, the child was born, and when the kid was, was well enough, he used to go along every Saturday morning to this man's office and collected the ten shillings. The chap himself was methodical, and he had his diary noted, and when the child reached the age of 16 years, he said to the child, well, he said, this is your ten shillings today, and he said, you're now 16 years of age, and I want you to understand that I'm no longer your father. Well, in about a quarter of an hour, he came back and uh, he said, you tell it to your mother. And in a quarter of an hour, he came back and he said, Mum wants to let you know that you never were my father. So he paid 16 years of maintenance for something that he, for which he was not responsible. Yeah, so you all wouldn't trust. Oh, thanks very much. That's nice. Nice to know I'm wanted. Oh, you're a lovely boy, John. Yeah, I know. Oh, you're a corker kid. You be careful with my knee. You'll get me excited. I'll never be able to stop, stop it. It's a pack of bloody crawlers. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, this is right. Oh. Oh, uh, well. It's, not, it's nice to know the thought's still there, Max. Yeah. Well, the action might be a bit slow, but the thought's still there. Oh, is it now? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> speed up the you might be like me, you might have to be hand started. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dad. John! John! Go to the commercial for some chap in a hurry wants to go to hospital, Steve. Come here! Tell him to break the other leg. Roger, 19, Great taxis. Yeah, just coming to town, isn't it? Right, okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, are you back in town, 30? Uh, just about to drop off the post office. Cobb Hotel, the parcel for Mrs. Shireen to go to 53 Firth. Have you had a good day? Um, yes, yeah, so I do. Better than expected. Ah, oh, well, that's not so bad. Right. How did your holiday go? Holiday's been great. Did uh, I see you, Melbourne? No, I haven't seen you since you come back. Only as passing past. I don't I think I've picked up since then. I saw one of the other boys, though, because uh, I ended up on the Kaimanawa. Forest Strangers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, went touring up there. Um, flew from Hakutika to Wellington. Night there. Saw the fern to Awakuni. And from Aukuni, there's a venture track. Yes, we're away. You are going home, I take it? No, I'm going up to Dixon House. Are you? Yes. Oh, good God, I didn't know that. That's where I live, John. Ah, uh, well, I've just made a mistake, haven't I? Well, we better turn round. Yes. Oh, how long you shifted? Uh, eight weeks ago. Is it? Good God, I didn't know that. <laughs> We've lost another good Cobden person. Sixty-six years in Cobden. Yes, that's bad. We can't have you people slipping away on us like that. Uh, have to do something. Too hard to keep the house and everything by yourself. Oh, this is it. Yeah, this well, is it. How are you going, Barry? Drunk. Drunk? Oh, well, you're allowed to be, I suppose. I don't know what Mother will say when you get home, but never mind. You'll face that when you get home. That's right. And what's the excuse? Very free, Emma. Ah, radar. Yep. Mm. What's the excuse for being yeah, on the grog today? Way. Hey, where you going? Six. You're going to Cobden, aren't you? Who's him? You're going to Cobden? Who's him? Oh, he's just a mate of mine. <laughs> Find me, Jay, mate. That's good. Mike, how are you? Mike. Yeah, Mike. Mike? Oh, Mike. Pleased to meet you, Mike. I drank. Whereabouts are you going, Barry? Six. Six. Six what? Twenty-six. Six. All right, going home. You're drunk. Should have done work today. Oh, didn't you go? No. Well, you can give your boss a wave and as you go five past. Five years of food. I've got to drive a truck down here tonight. Where to the fair? Yeah, and parade. You'll have to go home and save up a bit, mate. Not tonight, mate. <laughs> 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 Bad money this morning. Big stuff for a fortnight. Come again, Ian. Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> No, Mick, little night on a pub crawl. Did I? I lost him. Nobody has that job, Helen. Six. You lost him. Yeah, right up there. Yeah. Yep. You lost him. Up. How'd you lose him? Okay. Yeah, you can't remember how, eh? Um, what's the story you at? Oh, 
Oh, well, I don't think you'll be driving that truck to the fair, mate. Do a wrap around the block. Yeah, do a wrap. Yeah, you're out. No. Is that my pension? What were they patching? Well, we need to work this morning. We need to take bank cards. Yeah, bank cards. Bank cards are specialty today. Have a drink. Haven't got time, Barry. Got to go to work. Must be first job for the day. Right. You got a dollar. Have you got a dollar? Yeah. Is that all you got? I've got to find some more. Oh, well, you might find me 2 30 if I'm a good boy. Well, I asked you. You did too. You asked me nicely. Well, I stand up. Hey, hey, you can have, you can have one back. Judge? Yeah, you can have, well, you might have that back. Yeah, yeah. You, and you can have that back. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Boy, take, it quietly. take it quietly. Don't drive that truck tonight. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Whereabouts are you? Twenty-three. I've listened to what the coasters have said about the weather and I've genuinely looked at the rainfall figures that they've provided and listened to their arguments that it's nowhere near as bad, but I've reluctantly accepted that it's pretty wet here. Good evening, I am Angie and the Bankers. I live in a jungle, eat, I, I eat mice and holes and wire netting. I get swimmy long drinks from rivers. <laughs> as far as the future is concerned, this is an area that is many places man hasn't even trod foot on. There are minerals in a great number the length and breadth of the coast. One can go in a plane into South Westland and near sunset photograph the red hills and they will come out red on your colour photograph and they're red with copper. When I first took over the mayor they closed the mines, all the state mines. Tom Shen came and said you've got to have faith and guts and we did. And I told them that the last wave had gone out and it was going to come in and we were coming in on the crest of the wave. And we did. They said that the shops would close in the town and we would only be able to support three quarters of them. Neighbour was going away. The furthest neighbour would be going away. The man in the middle said, there is no future for us. But the grass is greener here than many other places. We're a rainforest area. I said, I th and it was quite spontaneous, I don't know where it came from, that I thought they had a cargo cult mentality. And I've thought about this a lot since and wondered why the devil I said it. Uh, but I've, I can't find anything to negate it. I still think it's true. Uh, there is always talk in the papers or on the radio about big things for the coast. But it seems to me the coasters do very little to make it happen. They're waiting for it to happen by the grace of God or Muldoon or... No, not Muldoon. Um, somebody, but not themselves. Uh, I can't quite understand it. I think possibly it's developed because so many things have gone wrong for them, for the coast. Plans have been put forward and then chopped off short. And, you know, it's a big disappointment yet again. Well, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Because mm. I, I think that what's happened um, right through the coast's history has been that it's been basically a colony, a colony for the rest of New Zealand. And there's been a tremendous amount of extraction from the coast. So what coasters have seen is their coal and their gold and their timber just going over the hill to Christchurch. 
And if you go and watch at the railway station, you'll see train loads of the stuff still going out today. And if you watch the trains that come in, they're virtually empty. And that's why I think coasters are waiting for something to come back in to replace what's gone out. You know, for literally over 100 years, it's been doing this. And I think that they are waiting. Unfortunately, if they, if they bring in some of the things they think would be the answer, such as big industry or chop the trees down, then what's going to happen is that they're going to um, lose one of their main attractions, which brings in the only form of finance they really have at the moment, and that's tourism. And if they change it too much, they will lose that. And that at the moment is what's coming in. That's the only sort of cargo cult that I see, that instead of those empty wagons coming back, they want full wagons. And the full wagons have got to be tourists. I can't see that it really will be anything else. The weather problems, well, the rain's bad enough. We, as you know, we get a, uh, quite a bit of heavy rain. But um, the worst problem that we have on the, around the coast here in Grangemouth and outlying areas is the fog that we run into. Uh, you strike fog going to Renanga, and also up, if you go through to Taylorville, up to Blackball, you'll strike fog very thick up that way, and this does disrupt things quite a bit. You're well down in your speed. You've got to bring your speed right down to a sensible speed, which is sometimes down as just about, you've just about got to hit low gear. Fairly quiet all round tonight, actually. Oh, it's quite a bit like the reek. Yeah. Yeah, then we went down the eagle. Has there been any music around? That's yes, the golden eagle. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Who do you want? We went there and had some chips. Ah, not so good, weren't they? Not very good, no. Okay, we had an argument with some cops over here. Oh, that's bad. They thought we were trying to sneak in the door. <laughs> Yeah, they're in front of us. Uh, we'll try not to run them over. Look out the gates. See the old boat in there? Yes. It's pretty rusty, isn't it? Yeah, I'll say she needs a bit of a paint up. Mm. Mind you, that's the first boat we've had in, what, for about three years, is it? Yeah. No, I thought she was Japanese. No, uh, well, it could be, but it, mm. I, I only know that it's travelling to Fiji. Yeah, I noticed once I seen the, the portholes. I thought, I knew she wasn't Japanese once the portholes went slanted. Oh, yeah, so uh, very good. We'll give you a win there. Now, this is the time, about the time of the night now that you can pick up a few extra shillings. You've got two cars out of town. One's gone to Hogatika, one's gone to Blackball. So that means your car's short in town. There's a few people about. So if you can just lift your speed up a wee bit without getting too silly about it, I mean, you don't break the law too far, and this is the time that you can make up that extra few shillings that you've been missing out on during the day. Yeah. Where's the parachute? 
Roger. Okay, coming in. 